it's a great pleasure to be here today with Carlo. We've had a journey mm. together already, and it's been fascinating. So it's my honor and pleasure to sit here with you today. And we're going to be talking about identity, aren't we, Carlo? Yes, we are. So speaking of identity, um, you just told me earlier, which I thought was really interesting and probably be interesting for others to know, especially those not local to Cape Town. What was Cape Town's original name? The original name of Cape Town is known as Tui Taip, which means where the clouds gather. So in order to experience this phenomenon, you have to stand on Horikwaho, a mountain which rises out of the sea. Once you're on Horikwaho, you can look and survey the rest of Tui Taip, and you'll know why it's called where the clouds gather. So that's a bit of a, that's actually the original name of Cape Town. Yeah. Awesome. And whose original name was it? I mean, Cape Town has such a diverse history. Um, who, as far as we know, were the first people here? The first, the first people here are the Khoi people. So the Khoi and San are the same people. The San people are the hunter-gatherers. The Khoi are the nomadic herders. herders. So the Khoi Khoi word is actually the origin of the name of Cape Town. Yeah? What happened to those people, Carlo? Okay, um, since the arrival of the colonizers, the Khoi have been slowly and systematically eradicated through wars, smallpox epidemic, and most importantly, through the denial of identity, which is something we are currently facing today in South Africa. So, what do you consider to be your identity? My identity, although it honestly does not roll off easily off my tongue. My identity and my heritage, my roots, my connection to this country's coil sand roots. My connection is through the work that I do, which, which reinforces what I already know. You've mentioned to me um, that there's this term, especially in the Western Cape in South Africa, colored people, yeah. right? And it's problematic. Tell us why. This is problematic. The term colored, right, there's no meaning behind the word. It's a, de it's a derogatory term which robs us of our identity, of our history, our culture, our heritage. It denies us who we really are. And by doing that, you create a traumatic society. You are building, we're not, we're not even building, you are creating a nation without identity, which is so wrong. So if somebody were to just take a glance at you at first sight, um, they wouldn't be wrong in guessing that there's some Rastafari link here. That's yes. a part of your identity has been with the Rastafari movement. And how did you get to there? My, first of all, it was the, the curiosity and the interest in the dreadlocks. But it went beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> so... I mean, if you look at dreadlocks, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's not restricted to one particular culture. But within the Rastafari movement, know your roots, know your culture. Know you where you're coming from, know where you're going to. For me, that was the most important message that was emphasized. is about knowing who I am, know where I come from, know where I'm going to, know what I'm doing. I really need to know myself, not as I'm a happy person, I'm... I'm a hard working, but really know myself as in I have Khoi roots, I'm descendant of a Khoi person, and this is my country, this is my heritage, this is who I am. So the identity was a lot different. It wasn't self-discovery. It was an awareness identity of my indigenous roots, which has not been spoken of. Yeah. So the Rastafari movement, interestingly, led you to a deeper discovery of your true origins and history. And that, in turn, led you to an interest in indigenous plants, and you've become a bush doctor, yes. been for many years. Tell us, what's a bush doctor? Okay, when, initially when I started in the Rastafari movement, my question is, you know, what's, what's the thing with the herbs? Because it doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you're sitting with a Caribbean culture that has been influenced by Africa. And for me, that was a big thing. But also what I've learned was, what was emphasized to me is that working with medicinal plants, it was not a Rasta thing, it's a Khoisan thing. 
So that was emphasized along my journey all the time that the heritage that I was revitalizing, the knowledge that I was looking for belonged to us, belonged to the Khoi and the San people. So that was a big shift. Therefore, in any interview, it's easier for me to say that I'm a bush doctor because I identify with the work that I do and the connection that I have with the country. Great. So let's get straight to it. What's your key message for us today? Why are you here? The key message is about identity. Uh, having a three-year-old daughter and being a 43-year-old man, I've got a 40-year gap that's missing in my life. A 40-year gap related to my history, my culture, my language, my identity, most importantly, my identity. And having a, a daughter, or even having a child for that matter, it's not right that you're raising someone without an identity, without culture, without heritage, without history. For me, it's become more important having or even growing a family that we really need to know who we are. So going forward, you can tell people about who you are, your history, where you come from, who you truly are, not a derogatory term that has been stamped on you so your identity is taken away, your land is taken away, your people, everything is taken away from you. And we are going along merrily in this country while indigenous people are actually being denied the most simple right of being identified and associating with that identity. We have no means of associating ourselves with our core and our sand roots. So this is where my work comes in and why I love what I do because for me it's about teaching, it's about a journey, it's not a two, three year journey, it's a 20 year journey which I plan to take, not only with my child but future generations as well. So I always look at the bigger picture when it comes to the work that I do. And what, what was the language of the Khoi San? Or languages? Languages. So we have five uh, Khoi or San languages. Um, Nama being a standardized language. When I say standardized, it means we've taken the most common words, done away with your dialects. So if you go up to the northern parts of South Africa, we speak a different kind of English. If you go to Port Elizabeth, they speak a different kind of English. For sure. So. <laughs> Your accent um, plays an important role in how you speak. So what has happened is we've standardized it and we've pushed away the accent part so mm. it will be easier for us to learn our language. Our language currently is Nama, which is the official Khoi language. How many people speak Nama? Not many. In South Africa, our language is not recognized. Um, it's on the coat of arms. And the coat of arms um, says, E, E, Tarate, diverse people unite. But no one actually knows what it means. So that's the other thing with identity. You, you, we put things on our coat of arms, proud symbolisms, but you have no identity, you have no connection to the symbolism. So, And it's not an official language? Not at all. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. so, so we're talking about there's a schism, there's a break in the history and the lineage. Yeah. Uh, and what's, you know, there's, clearly this language isn't active enough today to be on the list of official yeah. languages. How do we begin to patch this together? Who are the people? Um, where are they today? Is there a thriving culture? Oh, difficult one. The people today, because we termed colored, we're not allowed that connection. And that's the big break in where it starts. So we don't have a mother tongue, we don't have a mother language. Second break comes in the history. There's a lot of our history which is denied to us. There's a lot of romanticism around the truth of what happened. Give us an example. The slave lodge in Cape Town. So the romantic version goes like this. At night, the men came in and they had sex with the women. The realistic version is this. The male slaves who moved, moved out of the lodge, the sailors and the men from the streets came in, did as they pleased with the women, they were beaten, they were raped. And later, at a later stage, they were traded for cattle. So we're sitting with this traumatic experience that has come through generations. We have 
families without fathers, there's no role models. We have more single mothers in our communities than anywhere else. So these are traumatic experiences which have come, which have come through during the years. The most important part about the message is me as a male person, having that done to one of our females is not acceptable. There's a lot of hurt that goes in that. And from my perspective, I've got a lot of healing to do. So do the other men, so do the other women. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. So I enjoy it. I enjoy the healing process that we go through. I enjoy speaking the truth because we need to know what has happened. If you, if you can't speak the truth, you can't heal the trauma. You know, they go hand in hand. You need to be honest with yourself about what's happening and what has happened. Only then can healing take place. So this has become the focus of your work, hasn't it, Carlo? Um, it's about healing past traumas through the generations. Yeah. Um, tell us about your main project. Okay, one of our main projects is platforming artists. Um, the other is the general language, history, medicine. In the two projects, what we do is, because I, I can extend my arena to life skills and art and because all related to healing and medicine. So what we've done is we've actually set up a program irrespective of the age, whether you're two years old or 70 years old, you're all welcome. So this program is actually there to help heal in different processes. We're not going to say you're a traumatized person, you have problems. That defeats the purpose of what you want to do. It's about nurturing and healing. It's a slow process and it requires patience. So, yes. Great. And how can the TEDx Cape Town audience and beyond find you, learn more, get involved? Okay, so support will be greatly appreciated, even if just by attending. Um, every Saturday we have a structured workshop from 10 to 3 in the afternoon. It covers our three groups of language, music, medicine, and history. History is a topic that as three individuals, we've taken it upon ourselves to research and to tell the story. The other program called Tita Ge, which means I am, which is very close to me. This program is about people who know who they are. So if you know who you are, you can get involved in our project. It's that simple. <laughs> also with our project is that we promote artists, craft people that do their own work. So if you make it, you can sell it. Um, we have very simple policies about going about doing things. And it's grown tremendously. And we've had so much small achievements in the sense that um, there's people that have never been to the castle, never heard their history, and with tears in their eyes, they tell you how proud they are and how happy they are, and they're getting choked up, and you're getting choked up, and time <laughs> is moving on, and you have to go now because... And there's so much positive stuff that we do. We, we do interactive workshops, so you can look at the plants and look at the anatomy. You can make the relation between how your body works and how it needs to be healed. So we really look at the holistic approach of what we're doing and not want to force anything down your throat. So I have one more question for you, Carla. Yes. I know you have a young daughter. I've had the pleasure of meeting her. She's beautiful. What do you want to tell young children such as your daughter who might be shoved in the colored box, what's your message for them? That's a difficult one because, <laughs> honestly, for me, it's not about what, what you can tell them, it's about what you can do for them. And for me, instead of telling them who they are and what they should be, it's easier for me to show them examples of who they are and who they should be. Like I said, healing is a journey, it's a nurturing process. So whatever I do, it's not to shove it down your throat, it's to nurture you, to... You need to be self-reliant, self-dependent. You need to be able to stand on your own feet. You need to be, take ownership of who you are. And that can only happen one step at a time through a nurturing process. You can't force anything down anyone's throat. It will become worse, and we're trying to avoid a worse situation than what we are in at the moment. Carla, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.